Hi everybody, so we are back and ready to continue on our walk through the Torah. We're also going to discuss Joshua today, but we need to finish the Torah first. So uh, we ended in Genesis with Israel, uh, or, or the 12 sons of Jacob really, in Egypt. Now, after 400 years or so, or so in Egypt, Israel has grown into a very large group of people. They are still in Egypt, though. They haven't left Egypt. They're still in Egypt. They, they've been there for about 400 years, and they have grown around to around 2 million people or so. Um, some estimates are less than that. But uh, in other words, it's fairly large. It's grown from 12 sons of Jacob to about 1 million, 2 million people. So that's pretty significant. Um, however, over the course of those 400 years, not only has Israel grown, but Egypt has forgotten Joshua. Uh, Joshua was in charge when the 12 sons of Jacob came. However, he's not in charge anymore. And not only has Egypt forgotten Joshua, they have enslaved the Hebrews, uh, those descendants of Jacob. So. Genesis 50 ends with, jo uh, um, have I been saying Joshua? I've been meaning to say Joseph. Um, it, Genesis chapter 50 ends with Joseph uh, allowing his brothers to return to Egypt, them living in, in prosperity and harmony, um, of course under the rule of the Pharaoh, but also with a great deal of freedom. Then the very next chapter in the Bible, Exodus 1, uh, it, is after this 400 years and the Hebrews, the Hebrew people are enslaved. They are slaves to the Pharaoh. And so in Exodus 1, we start learning about the person of Moses. Now you might have seen, I don't know, the Ten Commandments or the Disney movie, that was it Disney, the Prince of Egypt. You know, Moses is born. Pharaoh has decided that he's going to kill all the Hebrew male children. Uh, Moses escapes because his mom puts him in a wicker basket, or in a reed basket, I guess, in uh, the river, and it floats down to the palace where um, a person finds it, and Moses is raised as a son of Pharaoh. Moses rises to prominence. Uh, he is, again, a Hebrew who is well favored by the Pharaoh. In fact, he's it appears to be he's second in command, possibly third behind Ramses, his brother, by adoption. But um, he's pretty high up. But he ends up killing a Egyptian slave driver who is, I guess, uh, very brutal to a Hebrew slave. So he has to flee to the wilderness. In the wilderness, and he stays there for 40 years. Um, and but in the wilderness, God calls him to go and tell Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go. And so you know, again, you might think of Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments, you know, or the old um, African American song, "Let my people go." Now, that might come to your mind. That's what Moses said. He said, "Pharaoh, let my people go." According to God, who is ruler over all the earth, let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh says. I don't believe in your God. Um, I'm not going to let your people go. And uh, so this happens from chapter 4 on through chapter 15. Uh, as Moses goes and tells Pharaoh to let his people go, and as Pharaoh says no, God starts sending plagues on Egypt. And there are ten of those. Ten plagues. And they range from the blood turning to water, to locusts coming and eating the crops, to... Uh, boils on people's skin, all sorts of disgusting things, um, and they culminate with the ninth plague being darkness over all the land, and then the tenth plague, which is uh, the death of the firstborn son of everybody in the land of Egypt, including the Israelites. However, God says that his angel of death will pass over the Israelites if they slaughter a lamb and spread the blood of that lamb over the doorway uh, of their house. While they are doing that and waiting 
uh, for God to pass over them. They are also supposed to be prepared the very next day to leave the land of Egypt. So God knows that as this plague comes, Pharaoh is going to finally let the, the Israelites go. And so what they're told to do is to slaughter this lamb and spread the blood over the door, but they're also told to prepare a very quick meal um, and to be prepared to leave the next day uh, out of slavery. And so this is, this is very Christian imagery here. Uh, you know, first of all, we have the idea of sacrificing a lamb and that if they're, the Israelites are covered by the blood of the lamb, that, that, that God will pass over them. He won't judge them as he's judging the rest of the world. Uh, this is what Jesus does for us. If we are covered by his blood, if we have faith in him, God passes over judgment of our sin. Uh, also, the idea that through this blood and through the death of the firstborn son, God is going to bring his people out of bondage. So again, Jesus, the firstborn son, uh, who dies as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice uh, for sins, through Jesus, uh, his people are brought out of bondage. Now, it's not out of slavery to the Egyptians, it's out of slavery to sin. But again, there's very, I mean, this is why the Exodus is referred to over and over and over again as the crucial salvation event of the Old Testament. And it's why Jesus' work in the New Testament is talked about in terms of the Exodus over and over and over again because there's such rich imagery here. So, um, indeed, that's what happens. God sends this plague of the death of the firstborn son, Israel is allowed to leave. Uh, you may remember in the Prince of Egypt or in the Ten Commandments, uh, Israel hits an immediate roadblock because on their way out of Egypt, they come upon the Red Sea and they can't cross. The Pharaoh gets mad. He changes his mind. He's coming behind them with his army. Here's the Red Sea in their path. And they're like, man, what are we going to do? God tells Moses, you know, raise your staff. And the Red Sea parts in front of them so that the Israelites can go through the Red Sea. Uh, Pharaoh's army follows. God closes the sea over them, and they perish. Uh, and, it, that, and so that brings us to the Song of Moses in Exodus 15, where Moses praises God for what he's done. In Exodus 16 through 18, they are wandering in the wilderness, traveling to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 19, they begin receiving the law of God, starting with the Ten Commandments. Now, in your reading, what you'll notice is that uh, Israel immediately begins to grumble and complain. Even right after they're brought out of Egypt and they're standing in front of the Red Sea, they're afraid, they don't trust God, they go through the Red Sea, then they start complaining that there's no food, that there's no water. They're like, man, why can't we just go back to Egypt? So Israel already starts complaining. And as God gives them the law at Mount Sinai, they not only complain, but they begin to worship idols. So God has saved them. Uh, he has brought them out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. And now they're already complaining. Not only are they complaining, but they're worshiping idols. And so the pattern in Exodus 19 through Exodus 40, as well as through Leviticus and then Numbers chapter 10, which is where the giving of the law ends, that whole section, the pattern is, God gives part of the law, Israel sins, he gives them more laws. Okay, so the, the giving of the law stretches from Exodus 19 through Leviticus and then into Numbers through Numbers chapter 10. That's a lot of law. And what we need to realize is that the context of the giving of that law is God has brought them out of Egypt, He's trying to show them how to live rightly before him as his people. And as he's showing them this, they're sinning more and more. And as they sin more and more, he gives them more laws. And what we see in Galatians chapter 3 and 4 is that God does this to try to restrain them from sin. He knows that if he doesn't restrain them with the law, that they will fall utterly into sin and destruction. Um, so that's the context of, the, of Exodus and of the law. Uh, in Leviticus, these laws primarily deal with uh, four things. First of all, there's the law of sacrifices. So Israel is, is full of sinners, as we've seen in this narrative. 
how do they live rightly before God? How do they deal with their sin? That's where the sacrificial laws come in. This includes uh, anything from offering uh, bulls and goats for, for giving thanks to actually atoning for sin. Uh, then you see there is this priestly narrative. This includes laws about uh, the priest's role and how they are to, to carry out that role. Uh, then you see laws to protect ritual clean, cleanliness. That should be cleanliness, not cleanness. Uh, sorry for that typo. These include dietary regulations, such as you know you can eat this but not that. Um, you know you have to do this after you know uh, your menstrual cycle if you're a woman. If you're a man, there's certain rules related to cleanliness as well. And these are again because. They're to show, first of all, that God is holy and we are not. And they're also intended to restrain Israel from diving deeply into sin. Um, so, you know, when we look at the laws, we think, well, we're not, we're not Old Testament Israel anymore. You know, why do we have to obey these laws? And the point is not necessarily that we have to obey them because Jesus has come and obeyed them for us. The point is they show us now how God is holy and how we are not. And for, for geographical, uh, ethnic Israel in the Old Testament, they were intended to protect them from destroying themselves with sin so that Jesus could come as part of Israel. Uh, then you get into the Holiness Code. This includes um, things like the Day of Atonement. It also includes blessing and cursings for those who obey the law and also gifts to the Lord. It's important to note that Israel... In, we'll see later in the Old Testament just as cursed by God because they continue to sin. And that's already promised here in Leviticus that, that if they don't obey the law, they will be cursed. Okay, then we get into Numbers. Uh, Numbers deals with the first generation of God's people out of Egypt. Uh, again, the first ten chapters are law. But then in chapters 11 through 25, Israel begins to rebel. And they rebel against God they rebel against what he has for them, and eventually that first generation is put to death. Uh, in chapters 26 through 36, the second generation of Israel is again reminded of who they are, and they actually are faithful to God, and therefore God is going to allow them to go into the promised land. So in Numbers, what we basically have is the finishing of the law, then we have the first generation of Israel that was brought out of Egypt complaining, rebelling, and ultimately being put to death for that in the wilderness. And then finally in chapters 26 through 36, the rebuilding of Israel in that second generation and encouragement to be faithful so that they can enter the land. Whoops. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, so then we get to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a reminder of the law. So now we have this second generation of Israel. They, haven't, they weren't there when God gave the law to Israel at Sinai. And so Deuteronomy is this reminding of what God intends for them, but also what they need to do to be fruitful in the land and to dwell as God's people in the land. So again, you see, here's the stipulations, but then here's the cursings and blessings. Okay, and so again, what we have is God is going to put Israel in the land. They're going to dwell with him there, and they're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. They're supposed to cover this land that God has given them. They're supposed to rule over it, just like it was told to Abraham, and just like Adam and Eve were instructed to do. But there are stipulations, there are curses, and there are blessings. And so what God is saying is, this is what you're supposed to do. I'm going to let you be fruitful, multiply, rule over the land, um, be my people here, dwell with me, but you have to do it in the way that I said you're going to do it. And so um, Moses is reminding them right before they're entering the land how they have to enter the land. And then we have succession arrangement because Moses is old and he's going to die. And he allows Joshua to succeed him. And that's the beginning of the historical books, Joshua through Esther. And Joshua, basically what happens is Israel goes in and conquers the land, and then it's divided up by tribe. Tribe, And at the end of Joshua, he again renews this covenant and says, Israel, 
This is what you have to do to stay in the land. So Deuteronomy, Moses reminds them, Israel, Joshua, they do it, and Joshua...